uh, by thanking thanking you, Alice, for inviting me to uh, this journal club, and um, and to everyone who's at uh, Northwell. Uh, I'll just say briefly that I've been watching your school ever since its inception. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation coming from there. You've got some wonderful people, mm. and uh, it's a privilege for me to um, to lead this journal club now. The topic is stress and resilience. My plan is, let me just move forward. My plan is to do um, just a few slides to frame the issue, which I know you are all familiar with, then to dive into the two papers. And I picked two, you'll see why I picked two. Um, they're related. And then um, after we go through the papers and, and um, discuss what uh, was reported and what, what have we learned, I have about nine slides to close out the topic of stress and resilience from a physiologic standpoint, and then a message for, for the audience. I do hope we'll have time for uh, Q&A. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So let me uh, quickly move to the issue of stress and burnout. Uh, we all know that uh, from the studies of Shanafelt back when he was at Mayo and the team there, as well as for many others, that one in two physicians will experience burnout um, during the year. Um, that varies by specialty. We also know that it's not just physicians. Uh, but actually all healthcare professionals exhibits high rates of burnout. You see this in nurses, you see it in, in others as well, and you don't need to be in healthcare per se to experience burnout. So our uh, non-clinical faculty and our academic centers um, are also susceptible to rates of burnout. But I'm gonna focus on physicians because that's what the papers were about and, and that's this particular element. Now, if we go and think about physician distress, the slide that I took from Colin West who's part of the team at Mayo. He lists on this slide five drivers, um, excessive workload. Um, and I'll say something about that. Excessive workload for those that uh, uh, want to know, working hard doesn't cause burnout, but working hard in an environment that's inefficient or uh, you, uh, best, that physicians can't control the environment in many ways, there are things that are out of their control or trying to integrate work-life balance to, with those uh, challenges. This is all pre-COVID. We haven't even talked about COVID itself and, and the pandemic. Mm. Um, that's what impacts on, on uh, physician distress. And then the last item listed is loss of meaning in work. This applies to virtually all jobs. When you lose the meaning of what you're doing, uh, you're, you're primed for uh, concerns about burnout. Now, in this slide um, that Tate Chanafelt wrote with his CEO at Mayo at the time, John Noseworthy, um, many of you may have seen this graphic. The left side talked, um, depicts the personal toll on individuals as they develop uh, syndromes of burnout, broken relationships, inappropriate coping strategies leading to depression and even suicide in extreme cases. And we know that the rates of suicide in physicians are higher than many other professions. On the right side, you see the toll on the institution, the decrease in quality of care, the decreased satisfaction, the decreased productivity. But the bottom line here is this, the physician turnover costs are enormous, uh, which is an important element in this. Now, there are many reasons why this happens. And to simply focus on one aspect, which is the individual, is, um, is really not giving it a full picture because there are strategies related to the work unit flow, there are strategies related to the organization itself and the culture, and there are national strategies that have to be taken into account as you think about uh, reducing the burden and the, and the stress on uh, healthcare workers. But these two papers and, and what I'm gonna talk about today begin with individual strategies because there are things that we can do as individuals for ourselves and for our peers. Uh, that can improve the situation. But by the same token, I don't want people leaving thinking that all you need to do is be mindful and everything will go away. It doesn't. That's only one piece of a larger puzzle. Now, what we do want is we want people to be resilient. And the question is, what is resilience? Uh, the American Psychological Association defines resilience. Here's a quote, the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, or threats. Um, adapting well, this, these two words don't, doesn't quite capture it for me. And so I prefer the definition that our authors from today's papers uh, wrote in a different article in an editorial uh, in academic medicine. And let's read this together because this is worth going through. Resilience is the ability of individual, they say, to respond to stress in a healthy adaptive way 
such as personal goals are achieved at minimal psychological and physical cost. And let's stop there for a minute. But what they're saying is, is that um, in order to be resilient, we know that we're all going to face stressors. The question is, how do we cope and deal with the stressors in ways that minimize our psychological and physical costs? That's actually an important element. Part two is even more interesting, which is what they say, resilient individuals not only bounce back where that image of resilience after challenges, but also grow stronger in the process. And I emphasize the words grow stronger in the process because that's what's happening with our students, with our learners, with our residents and with our peers when they're in situations that are challenging. The goal is to try and grow from it, not simply that I survive it. And the analogy uh, that I like to use is one of a tree being blown and pushed by a very strong wind. And if you know anything about trees, what you know is that as the tree bends in response to the strong wind, and hopefully doesn't break, when the winds die down, this tree actually got stronger through the process of bending. And if you'd like a medical analogy, uh, think about your bones and think about how bones get stronger when you put weight on the bones. When you stress the bones through um, uh, weight-bearing exercises, those actually serve to make the bones stronger. And, and so that's the intent here is let's have that image of, yes, our students, our, our residents, and our, and our peers face challenges, but those challenges will make them stronger. Now the question is, um, are certain individuals simply more resilient than others intrinsically? Are there something about how they're composed, how they're built, how they grew up uh, that makes them that way? And that was the initial premise that a psychiatrist named Steve Southwick at Yale, together with Dennis Charney, who's at Mount Sinai, and wrote the book um, Resilience, uh, their hypothesis was, yes, there's something unique about certain individuals that uh, seem to be more resilient than others. And, and to, to explore further what, what's the secret sauce for those people, they studied individuals that were Vietnam POWs and came back, survived incarceration and came back to society. They studied um, individuals that went through childhood trauma, survived that and became productive adults. And they also studied special forces instructors. And the goal was, what is it about these people that makes them resilient? Their conclusion after a series of um, articles is that resilience is not limited to an elite few. Anyone can learn to become more resilient. That's a very powerful message because this says to you is that it's not that some people are resilient more than others because they were born that way or their genetic makeup is that way. No, there are certain tools that people can learn to make them more resilient. And um, when I saw this conclusion, we invited Steve Southwick to be a speaker at the first Centile meeting back in 2015. And um, if you want to read more about it, his book, Resilience, is on Amazon. It's actually a terrific book. There's some things that we'll get to um, in that. So the point is, is that there are ways in which people can learn to become more resilient. So that brings us to this uh, editorial I mentioned a minute ago about Ron Epstein and Michael Krasner responding in academic medicine to another article written by a German authors, but they talked about physician resilience what it means, why it matters, how to promote it. And they listed a number of things that factors that individual can use to become more resilient. And you see things like self-monitoring and setting limits, attitudes that promote constructive engagement rather than passive aggressive and withdrawal behaviors. Um, that's all fine and that all makes sense to us, but take a look at the first thing they list, the capacity for mindfulness. And in many ways, this seems like a non sequitur. Where, how did mindfulness enter into this conversation with resilience? So let me pivot to just defining mindfulness and I'm almost done with this framing for you. But if we're going to talk about mindfulness, we need to refer to John Kabat-Zinn. John Kabat-Zinn is an individual with a PhD from MIT in molecular uh, immunology, I believe. And in the 70s, he took the Buddhist practice of um, insight meditation, mindfulness meditation, and secularized it as a way for individuals suffering from chronic pain to become, to become aware of their pain, but also help them through the pain episodes. And so um, lots of work has been done on mindfulness and its impact on health. For this purpose, I just want to use his definition of mindfulness. So let's, let's look at that. And I've parsed the words, I've highlighted them in blue, the ones that I want to focus on, which is, what is mindfulness? Number one, it's awareness. It's not nirvana, it's not the end goal, it's not 
whatever you want to make it, it's becoming aware. Now the question is aware of what? It's an awareness that emerges when you begin to pay attention, as he says in a particular way, on purpose. I'm focusing my attention in the present moment. Let me stop there. Focusing attention in the present moment on what is happening to me now. And you might wonder, well, why, why does that do anything? What, what is that all about? And uh, we'll see in a minute why that is. And we'll also see that it's very difficult. It's not simple to do to focus on the moment because thoughts pop into our heads and we get distracted. But if you're able to focus on the present moment intentionally, then other things don't begin to distract you. And as we'll see later in, in this hour, that becomes to be very helpful. Now, there are two other words that are key here. Anybody can mute them, please? Please mute yourself. Thank you. There are two other words in this definition that are critical. And for those of you living in New York, this is particularly uh, important, speaking as a former New Yorker. The words without judgment. We tend to judge all the time, and we judge ourselves harsher than we judge almost anybody else. If we're not doing things perfectly, then we're not pleased or we're not excited. We don't want to do it further. Without judgment means that as I focus on the present, what I am not doing is saying I'm doing it lousy, I'm doing it right, I'm not doing it right, I like it, I don't like it. It's simply becoming objective. It's not no value judgment, just what is happening to me in the moment. So that's the point of mindfulness, and we'll understand in a minute um, or further how that works. Here's a graphic to basically explain mindfulness to you. So imagine an adult and a child are walking through a beautiful park on a beautiful day, and the child, the shorter figure, has no problem being in the moment and appreciating exactly what's going on. The adult, on the other hand, more times than not, has a head full of stuff worries about future and funds and money and, and, the, and who knows what. The fact is this, if we can act like children many times and be in the moment, that would be a very healthy thing to do. So with that framework on stress, burnout, and mindfulness, let's move to our first paper. And what I'm going to do is summarize uh, the goals and the main findings of this paper and see what conclusions uh, we come to. So, um, you should have all had a copy of it. If you didn't get to uh, read it in detail, I'm going to summarize it for you. It's a paper that appeared in JAMA over a decade ago, um, and you see the title, Association of an Educational Program in Mindful Communication with Burnout, Empathy, and Attitudes Among Primary Care Physicians. So this is the group at the University of Rochester. And the objective of this study was to determine whether inviting individuals to participate in an intensive educational program that fostered mindfulness, that dealt with communication, and also um, had intentionality to boost self-awareness, is associated with improvement in physicians' well-being, these were primary care physicians, in their well-being, in their psychological distress, in their burnout score, and in their capacity to relate to patients. So that was the question. And the participants, they invited 600 people from the community, 70 people signed up. Most of these folks had fairly high scores on the burnout uh, scale that I'll show you in a minute. And the breakdown was 54% male and 46% female. Now, what was the intervention? The intervention had a number of phases to it. Uh, are we all there? Okay. The intervention had um, a number of phases. The first phase was an eight week phase in which the participants met once a week for two and a half hours. Wednesday evenings, we'll see in a minute how they spent those two and a half hours. And then between week six and seven of this first eight week phase, there was an all day silent retreat uh, followed at the end of the day by about an hour discussion. And then after the first eight weeks, the group of the participants met monthly in the same two and a half hours for the rest of the year. And then uh, they were followed for three more months post after the intervention ended. Now, what happened each week in these two and a half hours was that there was some didactic material discussed and presented. This was very short. This is 15 minutes. That means less than uh, I've been talking so far. Uh, 15 minutes on topics such as awareness and bias and burnout and meaning and boundaries and so on and end of life care. So each week had a different uh, theme uh, during this time. And then 
they spent most of the time doing one of two exercises. The first exercise was one, a formal mindfulness meditation. And again, these are exercises, if you're not familiar with them, that are designed to foster awareness. Body scan is when you scan your body from head to toe in very, very distinct um, movements from one place to another, focusing intently on each body part. Uh, sitting meditation is focusing on your breath with intention. Walking meditation is focusing on how you walk as well as your surroundings with intention. And mindful movement would be things like yoga or even expressive meditation. These are all designed, these four, to uh, boost one's self-awareness about their own body and their own environment. The second type of exercise is a writing exercise. It's a narrative, either from narrative medicine or appreciative inquiry. And what these are about, as you see written here, is that these are brief stories that each individual would write about experiences they had that linked to a particular theme uh, that was presented in the didactic material. And the intent there was to focus on interpersonal relational work and also the meaning in their work. So these then were shared. Now, I wanna say a bit more about these, uh, this, this approach. So um, if you're not familiar with appreciative inquiry, I'm giving you a definition here from the paper. But what you see here is that appreciative inquiry proposes that uh, reinforcement of positive experience are more likely to change behavior than exploration of negative experiences. Now, if you think about appreciative inquiry um, on an individual basis or a school basis, um, let me take a school as an example. Let's say you look at your institution and you say, you know, Hofstra Northwell Zucker School of Medicine, um, we want to be uh, more like X school. I'm not going to mention any, but you could decide who your competitors are. What are they doing that we're not? This is usually the way we do things. What are they doing that we're not? Or on an individual level, you'd say, you know, why is that person having so much fun at work? What are they doing that I'm not doing? We're looking at the deficits, whereas appreciative inquiry does the opposite. It says on an individual level, what is it that gives me meaning in the work that I do? How can I do more of that? Or on an institutional level, it's not what are they doing that we're not, it's what are we really good at? And what resources do we have that we could leverage even further to distinguish our uniqueness? That's appreciative inquiry. Now, another piece to this, uh, wait a minute, why is this not, there we go. Another piece to, to what they did was not just to have individuals write, but then to share either first in pairs and then with smaller groups. And the idea behind that is when you share your narratives and you listen to other stories, you're listening with the intent to understand, not to interrupt and not to say, oh, oh I get that, but rather to listen with an open heart. That generous listening is a very important piece of this. And then at the end of um, each of the sessions, there was a large group discussion in which a lot of what went on, both the mindfulness practice and the appreciative inquiry exchanges um, were shared. So there are two elements to their intervention of those weekly and then monthly calls. Now, what did they use to measure outcomes? They measured mindfulness using the two-factor bear scale. There are a number of different uh, scales that one could use to do that. This is one that's legitimate and validated. Uh, they used the Maslach burnout inventory that has three um, subscales, the emotional exhaustion, um, which tends to go up in burnout, the depersonalization, which also tends to go up in burnout, and personal accomplishment, which tends to go down in uh, burnout scores. And then uh, they use the physician, the Jefferson scale for empathy. Um, and then you see the rest of them, a global affective scale for mood states and uh, two other um, ways of looking at uh, dimensions of personality and psychosocial orientation. I'm gonna focus on the top three uh, in what I do. Now, if you read the paper, you see lots of numbers. I'm a physiologist, I need to see uh, data and, and look at patterns. So what I did was I plotted out um, the, the key findings that I think uh, are worth sharing. So the first one is um, emotional exhaustion, which is probably the most important subscale for the Maslach burnout inventory. And what you'll see here, uh, the baseline is when uh, individuals registered for this uh, educational program. Pre-intervention is right before the first session started. So this is all uh, control, if you will. And scores above 26, which is where this group is, um, for emotional exhaustion uh, suggests that that's already in the burnout realm. And what you notice is after eight weeks and then 12 months during the period of time, those scores came down. 
And then even after the intervention ended at 12 months, for the next three months, it stayed down so that there was a reduction in uh, the burnout score. At the same time, looking at empathy, one could see that empathy scores rose and stayed up over this um, intervention and then three months post. And when we look at the mindfulness scores, um, again, these were reasonable mindfulness scores, but those increased with practice during the educational program and stayed up uh, compared to the baseline levels. So mindfulness goes up, empathy goes up, and, um, and participants showed decreases in burnout scores. Now, they also began to correlate the changes in mindfulness with uh, a variety of other scores, and that was table four in uh, the paper. And what you see here, just summarized briefly, is that as mindfulness went up, those were significantly correlated with decreases in the emotional exhaustion scale, um, increases in personal accomplishment, which is a smaller scale and less impactful, I think, than, uh, than the emotional exhaustion. And uh, let me go back a minute. And um, decreases were also correlated um, in total mood scores. So the lower the tension, the lower the depression, the higher the mindfulness was correlated significantly. And of course, empathy, increases in empathy and increases in mindfulness were correlated. This does not mean these are cause and effect. So I don't wanna make give the impression that mindfulness led to these changes but they're correlated because we're, we're not in a position to um, um, conclude cause and effect from this data. But the correlations are important. So this is the author's uh, words on their conclusions. What they said was participation in mindful communication program was associated with short-term and sustained improvements in well-being and attitudes associated with patient care. And the patient-centered care issue had to do with some of the psychosocial elements that uh, some of the other scores uh, provided. Now, let's go back to Colin West because I think there's a lesson here. So here are the five drivers that I showed earlier. And what you see on this particular slide is um, organizational approaches to addressing these drivers and individual approaches. Um, again, this is not from the paper. This is from my um, trying to put this in context for you. So for many of these things, there are things the organization can do to help physicians reduce the driver's effect on them and thereby reduce load uh, burnout um, scores. And then here's what the individual can do. And I wanna focus on this individual uh, column because take a look at how many times the word mindfulness appears. As um, Colin West is saying, you know, there's data here that suggests that mindfulness practices can provide greater meaning in your work, uh, which would be a driver that would reduce. It could actually help you uh, with um, the issue of control or lack thereof, and certainly with work-life integration. So the word mindfulness comes up, and where Colin West got to put this here is uh, based on a systematic review that he and his colleagues published in Lancet in 2016, which was a review of over 2,000 articles, um, 15 of which were randomized trials, looking at what interventions seem to prevent or reduce physician burnout. And the bottom line from this particular systematic review is that, um, I'll just quote it here, the most commonly studied interventions have involved a combination of mindfulness, stress management, and small group discussion. And if you think, and that these um, strategies can be effective approaches to reduce burnout domain scores. Now, if you think about it, that's exactly what we saw in that um, intervention by the group of uh, Krasner et al. In, at the University of Rochester. So we come to the conclusion at this point, we're about halfway through, to say, well, it looks like including mindfulness and practicing it um, together with the appreciative inquiry narr narrative um, exercises can reduce burnout and increase physician empathy. And the scientist to me, the skeptic says, why? Why would it do that? And how would mindfulness help facilitate that? Um, is this, is mindfulness pixie dust at Disney? We poof and now all of a sudden you're mindful and you're empathic and um, there's got to be uh, some underlying reason. Now, uh, what the authors discuss in their um, discussion part of the paper was the link between mindfulness and self-awareness. And this is worth uh, to sensitize ourselves now to this, which is what does mindfulness do? You're focusing on the present you're learning to become more aware and that awareness expands. And so mindfulness enhances both intrapersonal and interpersonal self-awareness. This is the relational part. 
which can improve well-being and effectiveness in clinical practice in terms of how you listen to patients, how you know your your presence, how patients perceive you. And in addition, self-awareness can assist practitioners in becoming more attentive to three very important pieces, to the presence of stress in their lives, to their relationship to those sources of stresses, and to their personal capacity to attenuate the effects of those stressors. This is the authors, this is Krasner and Al, in their discussion outlining this. I'm gonna come back more to the issue of stress and the linkage here in the latter part of this uh, presentation. But this is where we are with that first paper. Now, um, Wendy, I'm going to turn this to you. This is your slide. If you want to say something about uh, the bibliometrics on this particular paper, is that all right? Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I reviewed um, the Scopus metrics for this particular paper, which um, includes both alternative metrics from social media and um, and regular media um, outlets, as well as traditional metrics of um, site facts. So this particular article had, um, as you can see on the screen here, a, a large number of site facts. There are 792 citations um, from the, the, the time that it was published until recently in 2020 um, that this article was cited in other 792 other um, uh, articles. Um, if you look at the box on the left-hand side, um, you'll see four kind of um, buckets. So there is usage, um, and this simply looks at how many people have looked at the abstract, um, have accessed the full text, or have accessed the HTML full text view. Um, those numbers are very high. Um, what I actually want to um, direct your attention to are the captures, which is the next um, category on the right-hand side. Um, the captures capture both um, several um, avenues. In this case, we have site you like, which is uh, social media. Um, it's, it's kind of like a hybrid between social media and the ability to um, send citations to fellow researchers and um, others. And so there were um, seven readers from site you like. There were over a thousand experts and saves from the EBSCO platform. Um, that's probably where the, the, the publisher platform um, originates from um, in this case. And then there are Mendeley readers. Now, I've um, spoken about this in the past. Um, of all the social media um, statistics, uh, the number of Mendeley readers that um, save a particular article into the library is um, that number is more indicative of whether that article is eventually going to be cited in, a, in a, another manuscript or another paper. Um, there are four categories, but there are they're all coming from Mendeley, and as you can see, it is very, very high. Um, down below, there are social media mentions and um, and other mentions other than social media. There's um, there, there's been 41 tweets. Um, 12 shares on Facebook, and um, there have been mentions in um, blogs and also three um, news media, media mentions. Um, if you can uh, go forward to the next slide, please. And um, it sounds like someone might need to mute their mic. I hear a lot of, um, Anthony, I um, a lot of feedback. Thank you. Um, so this is the altmetric um, uh, screen for this particular article. The badge on the left-hand side indicates the altmetric score um, for, for this article. The altmetric score is calculated um, on, on, on several, uh, actually more than several, uh, on many, um, uh, many kind of uh, levels in which um, certain articles are mentioned. Um, and if you go down to the um, bottom of the left-hand side, um, it may be a bit difficult to read, but it also tells you um, who it's mentioned by, um, how many readers, and how many citations and dimensions, which is also a component um, of the, the overall metric um, platform. And they're, they're pretty much very similar to what you've, you've seen in the previous screen. There is a very high um, number of readers that, say, that have saved this particular article um, to their Mendeley library. Um, and then in the middle of the screen, you'll see um, the regions and where, where the readers are coming from or where they're accessing the, the articles from. All right, thank you so much. Great, that's um, very helpful. And this is, we agree, a fairly large, fairly high score. For an all metric. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Um, and it's, it's, that score is um, similar to impact factor. I really, that score is different based on the subject or a subject area, but 144 um, is, is, is very high. Um, I'm not quite sure in comparison to other journals or other articles of the, of the same topic, but um, what we've seen so far, in, at least in Meta Journal Clubs at 144, is very, very high. Right. All right. A lot of buzz around it is how I describe it. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank so you. Let me turn to the second. Um, uh, all right. Let me, let me turn now to the second article and you'll see why I picked two. I wasn't trying to double your workload, but the fact of this Hello? is that um, can someone mute themselves? Yeah, hi, speaking. Um, Hello. Oh, hi, Brody. How are you? Um, I'm good. You please mute yourself. <laughs> please mute yourself. <laughs> oh, my dear, my darling. Thank you so much. It's not easy. It was not uh, easy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, Alice, this one's yours. Okay, let me go on participants and Actually, see. If yeah, yeah. No, everything's fine. Yeah, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Okay, go ahead, Adi. Oh, I have to unmute Adi. Wait. Let me unmute Adi. Unmute. Okay, you're unmuted, Adi. I muted everybody else. Sorry. Good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so my purpose in wanting to share this paper is that it's really uh, part two to the original study. So what they did in this paper, which was published in Academic Medicine three years after the uh, previous article, is they invited 46 out of the 70 physicians that took place in the original um, uh, course and uh, conducted structured reviews uh, with them to really try to dig at what, um, what was the impact of the course. And so uh, this is a qualitative study. The goal here was to understand in greater depth what aspects of their experience contributed to the improvements in well-being and patient-centered care that we just talked about. Um, out of the 46 physicians, uh, they invited 22 to participate, two dropped out, and by the time they finished the 20, they figured they had enough uh, material, qualitative material uh, to go forward and they didn't solicit other uh, folks to be interviewed. Um, I guess it took them quite a while. So uh, the criteria for the participants, what they had to attend at least half the sessions of the intensive eight weeks and then half the sessions of the monthly. Um, and as you see that 46 that were, uh, that qualified. These were semi-structured interviews. There were two interviewers. They used open-ended questions. The article has the, um, uh, the interview form, uh, a list of questions, and then uh, the broader team reviewed the transcripts and developed themes. So here were the themes that were found um, from this, and the article has excerpts. I'm not going to repeat those, but here are the main themes. Number one, uh, the sense of personal isolation uh, was evident. These were primary care practitioners in the Rochester, New York area, and the desire to share those experiences. Um, that turned out to be an important theme, probably the, the number one theme. And um, as was commented uh, by the participants, the fact that there was a non-judgmental atmosphere helped participants feel emotionally safe, to pause, to reflect, and then to disclose with peers uh, what they were feeling and, um, and experiencing. Uh, mindfulness itself, the skills that they learned and developed um, out of the 20, 13 had uh, were new, seven had previous experiences, um, I believe, unless I got that flipped. Um, 13 had no prior experience, right. So those uh, 13, this was new. For the seven that were familiar with mindfulness, it improved their skills. And um, the, the improvement in skills about being attentive, about learning to listen deeply, and developing this adaptive reserve is really their ability to become more resilient, if you will, in managing stress. And then number three, which mm -hmm. for my purposes was actually the most important observation, that developing greater self-awareness was positive and transformative though. They all commented about that, but yet the participants struggled to give themselves permission to attend to their own growth. In other words, they recognized what they needed to do. They recognized through this course that they had an unfulfilled need, that they need to take time to reflect, that they need to take time to um, care for themselves. And at the same time, their guilt in taking the time to do so became the biggest barrier to move forward. And this is, I think, reflective. It's an important observation and it's reflective of really what we're seeing, I think, in the entire healthcare community. 
is the guilt in taking the time to, for self-care, uh, as some think it's indulgent or uh, worse. So the author's conclusions, um, and I was editorializing there, so the author's conclusions mm -hmm. is that interventions to improve practitioner well-being uh, should promote a sense of community to get at the isolation phase, to um, uh, teach specific mindfulness skills, which help with self-awareness, but then also should give permission and time devoted to personal growth. That's where we need some work. So let me go back to Wendy, uh, just to summarize the uh, metrics on this particular paper, uh, which was not quite as uh, widely distributed and recognized. Um, go ahead, Wendy, it's all yours. Thank you. Computer. Um, so com anything compared to the last article, uh, to be honest, <laughs> it's, it's hard to you know match that. Um, but even then, um, this still does, it did get um, a good amount of traction. There is still 120 articles that cited um, this article. And if you look at the, um, once again, the Mendeley cap shirt, which is that purple box, um, uh, it, it still does have, have a very large number of Mendeley readers who have saved this particular article to their library. Um, it was mentioned once um, in a news outlet and there have been um, two tweets. Um, but once again, the Mendeley readers um, uh, statistic is it's still high. It's not 999 high, but it's still um, up there. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. And um, once again, this is all metric data. Um, it, it's very similar to what you just um, saw. Um, there, in total, there were 268 Mendeley readers that um, was captured, at least with with this um, particular product. And um, what I'd like to highlight is that um, the number of um, uh, people that were um, not affected, but the reach of um, certain social media, um, in this case, um, tweets. Um, so there were five tweets from five users, and that and those five years, users have an upper bound of um, over um, 1,440 followers, which means that those followers potentially could have seen the the tweets or um, or retweets that they these followers. I mean, I'm sorry, these users had posted on their account. Thank you. Wonderful. Right, so um, not quite the impact, but certainly an important corollary. And those that have been tracking this study, um, I think saw the value in uh, the qualitative data that was published. So um, let me, I'm gonna go about another seven minutes, I hope I can wrap this in seven minutes and then give us some time. What I wanna do now is I wanna put this in context of stress and physiology and uh, understand the bigger story. Adi, right oh. before you start now, if anybody has any comments they want to put in the chat box, I'll monitor so we can go right to discussion after this. Thank Perfect. you. That's great. So um, I want to go back to my original question, which uh, was, okay, it seems that these interventions seem to help. The question is, why did they help? And what I'm going to propose in this graphic is the following, is that every day each of us is faced with multiple stressors, and these stressors come at us. And if we do not respond appropriately to these stressors because of our condition, because of our mindset, because of whatever the situation is, that these stressors will build and eventually cause chronic stress and burnout. On the other hand, if we begin to utilize certain strategies, and I listed a number of them, like cognitive reappraisal, which is reframing things and using positive psychology. And uh, as we learned from this particular uh, set of um, papers, reflection and appreciative inquiry and finding meaning in work. And yes, mindfulness meditation, these are all individual strategies that can help us and our peers meet the challenges of stress and actually reduce burnout and boost resilience. This is the hypothesis. Now, at the core of this hypothesis is the stress response, which is how do we respond to stressors? And what this graphic is showing, something that you all learned in physiology back in medical school, is that if you look at this cartoon of a human and you see the stress on top, it doesn't matter if we're talking about physical stress, emotional stress, psychological stress, the brain perceives this um, insult on us instantly and makes an appraisal, is this a threat to me or not? It could be uh, whatever in those categories that I just mentioned. And if the, um, if the conclusion is yes, this is a threat, 
then the cascade ensues, and the cascade is exactly the same. The hypothalamus releases CRH, and the pituitary responds and releases ACTH, and the adrenal responds and releases cortisol, which increases blood sugar, among other things. And meanwhile, the hypothalamus also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, so that we get heart rate going up, blood pressure going up, blood flow to skeletal muscles goes up, the high glucose enables us to meet this, and we have our fight or flight response that you're all familiar with. Now, the system is so good. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. This is amazing. The system is so good that when cortisol is elevated, it actually is designed to turn itself off so that the stressor goes away, the high cortisol feeds back to the pituitary to shut off ACTH, ACTH feeds back on the hypothalamus to shut off CRH, CRH could turn itself off, and we have a situation in which we have a stressor, the stress response ensues, the stressor is dealt with, and things come back to baseline. And so this is a wonderful experience that we have. This is how we get through life. This is how we raise teenagers. This is how we live uh, with all the challenges that we face. The question is what happens when you have this situation? You have one stressor on top of another one. And now what you see is that the stressors have combined and the additive effect results in a loss of resiliency. What does that mean? It means that the levels have not come back to baseline. And a third stressor, and in fact, I don't even have to ask you, how many of you deal with one stressor at a time before you move on to the next thing? In fact, we're being bombarded all the time. And the COVID pandemic, if anything, has illustrated how stressful situations can be as we think about our health, our welfare, our loved ones, finances, practice, teaching, you name it. These are all coming at us. And so the whole purpose of um, I would say the, the teaching of mindfulness and understanding self-awareness and all the things that we talked about is to do one thing. Look very carefully at this slide. Took a med student a week to make it for me. Watch this. The whole purpose of what I'm going to show you is to take those levels of stress hormones and bring them back to baseline. That's the essence. That's what these tools do for us, these practices. Now, if we don't return to baseline, what happens is that the high cortisol dysregulates the feedback system. So now we are impaired to deal with novel stressors. There's a big difference between acute stress and chronic stress. Chronic stress Im impacts on our brain, on our hippocampus. We can't learn as well. We don't retain um, uh, memory as well. And so there's a big difference between acute stress, which actually is a good thing in most cases, and chronic stress, which is what is debilitating and causes illness. And so what's going to help us to get back to baseline? And this is where mind-body therapies like meditation like guided imagery, like biofeedback, like this autogenic training, which is a self-hypnosis, like learning simple breathing techniques, all of these have a role in bringing our levels back to baseline. For many, it's uh, physical exercise. For others, it's more gentle yoga or Tai Chi. And the essence of group support, which I list here on mind-body therapies, and which is an important component of that study by Krasner et al., is the group support becomes a healing experience for people to share and to become um, connected with others that begin to understand. And the important here is the non-judgment allows people to feel safe and free to share. So if we just um, wrap up by saying, so why is mindfulness meditation effective in reducing stress? Well, think about what happens when you uh, practice mindfulness meditation. It's the intentional focus of attention without judgment on the present moment. Now, when you do that, what you're doing is you're focusing on the present. You can't, you're not allowing other thoughts to come in. And what you're doing with thoughts when they come in is you're not engaging with them, you're parking them. And so then the mind is not being anxious or worried because it set those aside. Now, for many people, you can do that for five seconds and then your mind gets overtaken. This is where the practice comes in to try and extend that period of time to 30 seconds, to a minute, to five minutes. That's the point. And when you're able to practice this, physiologically, what you see is a series of changes in heart rate and in cortisol levels and in um, perceived pain, which is nothing more than running the stress response in reverse, the physiology of de-stress. And psychologically, what we see is the same thing. I feel less stressed. I feel less anxious. I have more confidence. I'm undercutting that worry and rumination. And so this is the psychology of de-stress. This is where how these things are working. It's not magic. It's not pixie dust. It's simply a physiologic um, intervention that is interfering, reversing the stress response. And so I want to close with this. 
This is a slide from my colleagues at the University of Cincinnati, um, based on an article by Bodenheimer and Sinsky that I know many of you are familiar with, which looked at the triple aim, that is the goal of having better health, patient experience at lower cost, and added a fourth aim, saying, no, we need the fourth, the quadruple aim. And the fourth aim is the care of the provider, the care for ourselves. We cannot move forward without insisting and ensuring and creating the environment for self-care of the provider. Uh, this is up to us to do. And what we saw from the two papers, A is that this could work, and B is that we are the worst enemies. We are the barrier. And this is what we have to begin to address and make it safe and give people permission to take care of themselves. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna unshare my screen and I'd like to open it up uh, for any comments or reactions. Thank you all for listening. I think we've got about nine minutes. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're muted yourself. <laughs> I muted my, even though I'm by myself in my house, I did mute myself. So you right. have some great people here on the call. Amber, I don't know if you want to discuss anything. I'm just calling out some people in terms of medical student stress and any of this. Um, anybody else on the call? Carmen Rodriguez is here in terms of work at, in the health system. She's a major leader of our Northwell Health um, leadership team. So that would be great. Um, I'd love to hear from some people on this call, anyone, I'm just calling out some people in terms of stress. Matt Cusillis works in the emergency room if he has any comments on stress since he's an ED doctor. Uh, I'm, curious, I'm curious about one thing, just to kind of tee it off for everybody, which is how many of you were not familiar with those two papers and found them useful? I'd say probably most, especially the older one. So there's a comment here by Ivan and then maybe if he wants to speak, but I'll read it out. I would offer the concept of social mindfulness. To me, this means attending to the social sources of stress, such as patriarchy, racism, and inequality that affects our patients and ourselves. Mindfulness should not be narcotizing opium of the people, but rather liberating to help us develop the wisdom and courage to change the world. Wow. I don't disagree. I, I, I think the, the, the word mindfulness has been abused as people think about finding, um, you know, insight and peace in their own bubble. The fact is this, is that what we found, um, we've extended the entire mind-body program in our medical school uh, to our staff, to our faculty, and to uh, our medical students. Uh, what we find is that um, while individuals can... Um, improve their own well-being perhaps through meditation the bigger um, impact is how they interact with others and so this notion of social mindfulness changing the environment that you're in by having people listen to each other in a more generous way uh, by reducing the judgment level you know no judgment is maybe um, a difficult to achieve unless you're in a very small group and you come there but but the fact is that people relate differently at our school uh, we have over 150 members of the faculty that were trained to lead these mind-body groups. It has changed them. It's changed me as someone who grew up in Brooklyn. I can tell you, uh, you know, we used to do judgment for breakfast, I say, and now um, it's a little different. So I agree with you. So Michael, a dear friend of mine, Michael Esposito, says this concept offered by Ivan is extremely important that source, social sources of stretch are not changeable by the individual who is by them impacted negatively. Great. Thank you, Michael. Carmen, do you want to say something? You put your name here, and I don't know if that's because you want to say something or not. Maybe not. Well, I'm, I want to say one more word about this and maybe provoke some of them. Um, you know, it's fine to say that the world is lousy, that there's racism, and we can change that by becoming more mindful ourselves. But, you know, that's like saying you know, burnout has got lots of things attached to it and just being mindful won't change the medical system. That's true. But if there's one thing that I've learned, you know, it, it takes a lot of, there, there are many factors here that have to come into play. But having said that, what I've learned from the qualitative study, the small one, is that we're a barrier. Is that even when we know that it's going to help us, 
we feel guilty about taking the time to do that. Now that mindset has to change. And the only way it's going to change is when leaders model it themselves. You know, my dean said to me, what is the one thing I could do to prove or to demonstrate to my faculty, to my students that I actually think self-care is important? I said, put a sign outside your door that says, come back in five minutes, I'm breathing. And he goes, why is that gonna matter? I said two things. One is nobody thinks the dean breathes. And secondly, you're taking time out of your day to basically say, you know what, I need to just settle down here for a few minutes. And by doing that, you're giving permission to, do, to others to do the same. And that's what we're gaining when we do these groups is that we have two faculty in there leading this and modeling it. And so that's how we begin to change it. I'd like to just show you this book that arrived from Amazon two minutes ago at my doorpost. Um, this is a brand new book, Hot Off This Press, written oh. by a Northwell colleague. Oh, great. And it literally, I got my copy two minutes ago at my doorstep when Amazon emailed me that my book was delivered. And um, Lisa Langer is a John Kabat-Zinn trained um, mindful person and um, this is her brand new book that just came out and I ordered a copy. So um, it was just interesting that it arrived at this moment. So it was timely on this talk. Um, anybody else would like to make some comments? Mark Richmond, you're a thoughtful person from the emergency room. Any thoughts on any of this and how to work this into our lives at Northwell, especially in this transition from COVID crisis to COVID reentry? Hi, Mark. Oh, hi. Hi, Alice. Um, so, uh, obviously, this was a very stressful time, and our department did a very nice job. They created a meditation room for us, or the, a Zen room, and they had uh, some low lights. Uh, they put out snacks. They had some of that waterfall sounding uh, sound machine. Um, and I think that uh, I saw people taking advantage of it in the middle of shifts. They would go downstairs and decompress, and the uh, administration um, encouraged that. Uh, there was also a lot of, um, uh, somebody said in the first article, it, uh, or maybe it was later in the second article, the idea of sharing your experiences uh, as a way of decompressing, uh, the need for that sort of social release. Uh, so we were doing that a lot. Um, I don't know specifically about people doing mindfulness meditation um, and of course the ability to exercise and use other forms of uh, focus uh, was largely disappeared. Um, but I think the administration did a very nice job encouraging uh, mindfulness to the extent that they could even when we were on shift by creating that Zen room. That's a really nice thing to hear. Um, that's great. Thank you. I know I've heard the emergency department has did some really great stuff during this very stressful period when they were hit hard. Carmen Rodriguez wrote, I'm not aware of the article, so I was glad I was exposed here to the fantastic um, dissection of them. Moving forward, physicians, nurses, and all healthcare workers, as well as all associated with medicine, will need to do mindfulness and more and more. And someone else wrote, mindfulness helps us see the little things in life. I've been running my MAPIT program on Zoom this month, which I thought never would happen. And it, April was on Zoom, May is on Zoom, May was on self-care, and actually June is on mindfulness, Adi. And um, Lisa Langer um, is my consultant on the mindfulness month in June through the health system. But this month, last night I ran a MAPIT group, and this morning I ran a MAPIT group. And both of them talked about the need for the coming together and talking piece of de-stressing. And many participants spoke about the need for this and the MAPID session was one hour, but the more need and more need for this. So I think it's something to send home to the leadership. Commons on the call, Andrew Yachts on the call, leaders are on the call, Tara's on the call, um, people, need space to be talking together about what's just happened. And this has come out in my MAPIT groups where actually I got two emails post MAPIT group this last night and this morning. Where can we have spend more time talking about what happened? So I think this COVID experience is really bringing forward. And um, I just had a paper accepted on MAPIT, Building Resilience and Deep 
an increasing personal accomplishment that's going to be published in Mayo, and it actually has the quadruple aim in the title of the paper. So you'll be seeing that paper, Adi. Wonderful. I think we're at 101. I hate to go uh -huh. over, but, but Mark, thank you for sharing that about the emergency room. I could tell you that at uh, the Washington Hospital Center, the head of the emergency room, Susie O'Mara, um, came to our training and said it transformed her. Um, she's still the same old tough woman, um, very, very decisive. But, but what, what's changed for her is the importance of recognizing in her what she needs to do. And it's helped her. That's great. Great. Anyway, anybody else have some last comments for Adi? I'd like to thank him for coming and spending the hour with us. And um, anything, last comments? Wendy, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Wendy. And, um, I was going to say, oh, go ahead. this is Elena. No, I was thinking of the Muppet session last night. That it was scheduled for an hour, and we went over an hour, but the people wanted to to share these experiences. And uh, it was wonderful to hear uh, how they've been uh, overcoming the tough situation. And it's been very tough in many levels, um, personal and at, at work. And, and it's very difficult and it's something that is uh, taking uh, a long time. Uh, that is, is going to continue with us. So this is so important and I appreciate it. I like uh, you comment about um, how could I show others that this is important, start doing it ourselves, the five minute um, sign. I think that uh, there's a reminder that we need to think more about how we could do it. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And yes, Elena was with me last night for some tough stories, um, for sure. Um, thank you. And we don't have any more journal clubs till September. This is my summer break, June, July, and August. So I'll see you all in September, hopefully in a less crisis-oriented world. And we always do this on Zoom, so that will not change for September. And I wish everybody a fabulous summer. And um, Everyone be healthy and safe. And thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.